Hey folks, this is Mike Shea from slyflourish.com and twitter.com slash slyflourish here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy Dungeon Master Prep. Uh, in this show, we go over the steps of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master uh, while, I'm going to put up there on the, on the left, while uh, preparing for my weekly Tomb of Annihilation game. Um, in this show, we go through the eight steps and uh, use it to prepare for the game, as I said. Uh, we also chat about all sorts of things uh, based on Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Tilda DeWilda is here, as always. Hello, my friend, and welcome. MSC is here. MSC. Hello. Nice to see you. If you are on Twitch and you are seeing this, please uh, say hello. And if you see any weird oddities with the stream, uh, please let me know uh, that as well. So uh, we will start... Each show, each show I like to say, oh, and my mom is here. Hi, mom. Yvonne Kasuth right there is my mom. She likes to watch my show too. She's very nice. Uh, so I would like to start each show with a quick review of the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. For those of you who have been watching, this is, uh, uh, you've seen this before. I suppose it helps to sort of reinforce it. We'll, we'll call it reinforce, reinforced learning, not just redundant stuff um, as we go through the steps. If you do not own Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, you can, of course, buy it. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, it is in the links below. If you are watching on Twitch, you can see the links uh, below as well and pick it up for eight bucks for the EPUB and PDF version. Uh, there is also a preview, which includes two chapters from the book. And the two, one of the two chapters includes the eight steps, uh, a brief summary of the eight steps that we use uh, during this show. Uh, so you can follow along without spending any money at all if you if you so choose. But uh, my hope is that you will get a lot out of the book too. Um, for those of you who backed it uh, or are looking forward to the hard co or hard copy version, the soft cover and hard cover versions, uh, I am hoping to have them soon. I got a notification this morning that they have shipped to me. So these are the proof copies. We do a, we do a proof run before we, we send everything out to make sure that everything is okay. And I have a copy of the soft cover and the hard cover coming soon. Um, and I hope to get those early next week. I'm, I'm away the following week. So uh, if I don't get it next week, I won't get it until two weeks from now. And then if there's any problem with it, then it has to go through the cycle again. So um, print, print copies are harder than soft copies. But the soft copy is available. It's $8. It uh, has all the material in it. It looks really great. It includes an EPUB and a PDF, so you can re read it easily on a phone. Um, so that's all great. So enough of that pitch. Anyway, so let's go through the eight steps just to remind ourselves. Uh, the eight steps are what we go through when we are preparing, to, when we are preparing our games. Um, they are, they're inclusive, so there's a lot of steps. Eight is a lot. The original book only had three. But uh, you don't necessarily need to go through all eight steps. And as you'll see in today's show, um, uh, just scrolling down here. Here it is, Lazy Chapter 2, Lazy Dungeon Master Checklist. Uh, as you, um, what was I saying? Uh, yeah, as you go through the steps, you can say, yeah, I don't really need that. Anything you feel like you don't need, you don't need. These are all about helping you um, feel prepared for your game. That's almost entirely it. Having the stuff is nice. But as some people that have been on this show before, some people that have talked in chat have asked, you know, what happened? You know, how, how often do you actually use your notes during the game? And the answer is sometimes I totally forget that I have my notes. I usually try to send them to myself an email when I'm done with this show, but sometimes I forget. And, and the fact is just the process of going through it is usually enough. So um, a lot of it is just feeling prepared, you know, and, and many of the steps, including um, the big one is the, the, uh, uh, the outline, uh, the outline potential scenes. That was one that like was in and out of the book. Uh, so I didn't have it originally. Then I added it. Then I pulled it. Then I added it again. And I mostly added it because it's a, it's such a common step that people go through. And it was like not having a step that so many people go through seems weird. And also there is an advantage in it. And I, and I do use it from time to time. So uh, that one ended up back in. But it is probably the first to go when, um, uh, when I start to cut the steps down. There is, in fact, an entire chapter... Uh, let's go back to our table of contents here. Uh, there's an entire chapter on uh, cutting cutting stuff re called Reduce the Checklist. So this is a whole one about, you know, deciding which steps are most vital and which steps you can cut. And I'm not even sure. I wrote that the, the three most important steps are create a strong start, define your secrets and clues, and develop fantastic locations. I'm not even sure that's true. I think you can almost get away with just the first two. 
Um, and then there's sometimes where you'll replace one of these steps with another step, particularly if you're using like a uh, published adventure and you don't really need to outline fantastic locations um, because somebody else did. Uh, you might add one of the other steps in, like review the characters, you know, that, that reviewing the characters can be pretty important. Anyway, let's go back to uh, uh, the checklist. So the eight steps. One, review the characters. We took a look at all the characters that are going to be in their game. What's their background? Uh, what kind of classes do they have? What drives? What motivates them? We put all that in our mind so that while we're running our game, we have... Uh, we have them firmly in mind to plant hooks and draw on character considerations and put things in the adventure that tie to characters. The characters are the center of the story. We want to make sure they stay the center of the story. So we spend a little bit of time reviewing the characters. This doesn't even mean necessarily writing anything down. You could just sit back and stare at the ceiling and say, uh, Huit Zaline, the paladin of Ubtau who came from Port Nianzaru. You know, what's going on with him? What does he want? You know, how does he feel about the fact that Ras Nisi is now dead? Now that he's in the Tomb of the Nine Gods, how does he feel about that? Right? Just a question like that. You know, um, Ogechi, the warlock uh, who's tied to the uh, Ashodo. Uh, you know, what is his drive and motivation as he's crawling through the Tomb of Annihilation? Um, Warren, the uh, small uh, gnome... Um, druid you know he always wants to be something large but now he's in this tomb how does he feel about it? you know just kind of go through the character list you don't even have to write it down um next is probably i don't know i keep saying like which is the most important one one of the two most important steps is creating a strong start what what makes your game fire off hard right in the beginning how do you grab the attention of the players how do you say enough of the real world now we're in now we're in a new world uh what draws them in what throws them into the action. Think of the cold open from James Bond movies where, you know, very first scene is him racing in a car uh, or, or, you know, jumping off a cliff. You know, what, what are the things that can really bring the action to the characters and start the game strong? Outline potential scenes I described before. Sometimes it's handy to kind of have an idea of where things might go. Uh, but a lot of times you might say, you know what? Um, I have really don't know where it's going to go and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to lay off on this. But particularly if you're, if you're not running a published adventure, if you don't have any idea, this is one that's a real good one when, um, when you, you're, you know, making everything up on your own anyway, you're running your own adventure, you're running your own campaign, which from my understanding is most, most campaigns, most D and D games. Uh, from surveys that I've done of, D of Dungeon Masters. Most of them are uh, homebrew campaign worlds with homebrew adventures. So if that's the case, sometimes those outlining the potential scenes for the adventure can be more important. In something like Tomb of Annihilation, probably not so much. Define secrets and clues. This, I think, along with the strong start, is the next most important one. And it's what are the 10 things the characters will discover in the next game? Uh, this really taps into the idea of exploration. Uh, what will they find while they're exploring? It could be, um, you know, things that they'll learn. They, they can learn these anywhere. So when we write down a secret and clue, a secret could be uh, three hags are um, the nursemaids to the uh, being that's down in the tomb. Um, that is a secret. And how they find that out uh, is we don't define that. We only define what the secret is, not... Uh, close me. I close my door. My wife's right on the other side and she's playing in my other game. So um, what can they discover is important. How they discover it, we leave open. And that way they can discover it anywhere. That way, no matter what direction they go, no matter what sort of things they pick up or who they interrogate or whatever, we have things that we can drop in place that they pick up. It's a real... Uh, uh, I was on a, uh, a show yesterday with the folks from Con Plus One, a online uh, gaming convention that's coming in a couple weeks. And... Um, uh, you know, I, I said like, this is the reason I wrote this book is that, um, uh, this was, I really felt something that was missing from the original lazy dungeon master. It got me want to want to rewrite it, but I also added a ton of other stuff, develop fantastic locations. If we're not doing a published adventure, this is really important. What are interesting backdrops to each of the scenes that we think might take place? Uh, you know, what makes them interesting? What makes them unique? Uh, what are things that the characters can sort of interact with in these environments? Think of it as the set, the backdrop of a, of a scene in a play. Uh, who are the important NPCs that the characters might dis talk to? Uh, if there's particular ones that are important, we want to outline them here. A lot of times we don't need to because um, 
we uh, we already know who they are, or there aren't really any ones that are important, and we can improvise uh, NPCs pretty easily. Uh, choose relevant monsters. Again, if they're not defined for us, what monsters will, will come into play? Uh, I'll have an interesting thing to talk about with this in today's prep. Uh, what, what magic item rewards? Um, again, another one within a published adventure you might not have to worry about as much, but magic items really matter to players. Um, they are a major factor in a character's capabilities, and yet they're a thing that DM controls, so DMs should spend time paying attention to this. Uh, so those are the eight steps. Uh, that's all in the book. We can talk about all of this in chat if you guys have any questions about any of this. And in the meantime, we will switch over and start talking about uh, Pixelscape says, is that a new, uh, it's not that new. I've used it for a couple of months. Um, I just, you know, I have the ability to look at me. I'm like a pro Twitch person. I can switch back and forth. I even have a starting, oh, look at my starting pick. Oh, sorry. I'm playing around with my, uh, my overlays. Um, this overlay, by the way, and it's in the notes here, was done by uh, Eric Volgaris. Uh, he did this whole layout for me. It was really very nice. I'm very happy with it. So, uh, talking. let's see. This is, uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about what happened in last week's game. Um, so... A couple weeks ago, they had their great big explosion with the Red Wizards of Thay. Uh, Valindra Shadow Mantle was destroyed by the demon that was inside of the obelisk out front. And the Red Wizards were either, and their mercenaries were either destroyed or uh, ran off. And the party uh, got all nine cubes and made their way into the Tomb of the Nine Gods. Uh, inside the tomb, however, things got interesting. They had a really hard time with the first door. They got up to the great big devil face. And um, I think somebody did put their hand in it which is always interesting. And then they got attacked by a, and the GIF showed up. Yes, Navy DM, thank you for coming. Um, uh, the GIF, the big hippo people, there's always the good, let's, we gotta find a, find a good picture of the GIF. Uh, do I have the right thing in the layout? Yes, I do, all right. Whoops, I didn't wanna do that. Oh, I removed something I didn't wanna remove. Um, let's look up the GIF. G-I-F-F, not G I. TH. A GIF. Look at that. Hippo guy. That is a GIF. Monocle and steampunk pipe and blunderbuss and great big boots and wide, wide plus size trousers. So um, the GIF showed up and that was kind of an interesting thing that occurred. The party still has no idea how and why they showed up. So that's kind of cool. Anyway, they are now inside the tomb um, and they were hurt. Like they had not rested at all since their last um since their last foray so they were pretty beat up and they're like we want to rest right now so they set up a um uh what's it called Lehman's tiny hut which i kind of don't like I'm, I'm not a fan of Lehman's tiny hut it's kind of a pain in the ass uh, but they set it up right in the middle of the hall right so then it was like well people in the dungeon know that they're there like withers is watching them so withers is like well that sucks so withers is like send in a tomb guardian so they sent in this big axe wielding tomb guardian who like stood right outside of the tiny hut and the characters kind of peeked their head out and went, Oh my God, there's something out there, you know? Oh, and then he threw a cloud kill right around it. So the idea was as soon as the hut drops, there'll be in the midst of a cloud kill. And, uh, and then he dispelled magic on the tiny hut. So the idea is like when Withers is watching you, tiny hut ain't going to cut it. Right. And the players were a little frustrated with it. You know, they were kind of like, oh, come on. Are you kidding me? Like, we have this perfect hut. And you're pointing at me. You're just nerfing Tiny Hut. It's like, no, it makes sense. Like, Withers doesn't want you to make a Tiny Hut in the middle of his dungeon. And he has the capability to do something about it. He can crawl through some crack and cast a spell magic on it. So I, I need to clarify that. So that's actually a really good secret that, that needs to be revealed. Is that, you know, uh, what is he, the major demo? So there's a couple of uh, 
things. But I tell you what I think is more fun which is the idea that Withers doesn't just go and dispel magic on Tiny Hut. Withers likes to play practical jokes on people that are using the Tiny Hut. So we'll give him just a little, like, you know, twitch of the mouth, and he can do things like, I will surround it with rat swarms, you know, or I will, um, I don't know, I got to think of, like, other things that he can do to people that are in a Tiny Hut, you know, fill the you know, all kinds of traps that he can lay out. Like, you know, I don't know. I don't know exactly what. I got to I gotta think of like, and maybe you guys in the chat can help me out. What are some good practical jokes that Withers can play on people that have built a tiny hut? And like, let them get their rest. But as soon as the hut breaks down, there are, you know, bugs, lots of bugs, surrounded by bugs or, or hands, you know, grease. <laughs> grease and then a, and a, and a delayed blast fireball, right? Uh, we should make a separate list. Let's have a little separate thing here. Uh, 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 gelatinous cubes. Gelatin like surrounding them by gelatinous cubes would be pretty pretty awesome. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Um, I like uh, his uh, uh, his hands. You know, like his crawling claws. He's got lots and lots of crawling claws. Uh, those could be those could be some fun tricks to play on people that come out of a hut. So, uh, so they, they, they had the hut, that was tricky. Then they made their way, let's uh, look back over here on the map. So they made their way to the west and they found the sewer grate and then eventually went into 10, which is Moa's shrine. Was that Moa? Uh, 10. Uh, the, the 10, Obalaka shrine. That one wasn't so hard. They fought some whites, but they had an easy time with the whites. So I think, and maybe you guys who have run this adventure before know that like level one is easy. It wasn't nearly as hard. And I know that there's places later where things are really bad, but this one wasn't so bad. And, and reading some of the other shrines, it doesn't look like it's so bad either. Um, so they got in there, they, they went south uh, into the water and they went to 12, which is the crazy trap. And they opened the crazy trap and they got whatever was in there. I don't remember what was in there. Um, and now they're, they made their way along the river. Oh, and they got the first skeleton key. So they, they have one of the five skeleton keys that they need. Um, and I don't know where I'm going to drop the other four. I think it's the kind of thing where you put them in as soon as you want them to make real progress forward. Um, but they don't need to be done uh, all at once. And you probably want to, you know, uh, Uncanny Adventure says level one isn't too bad in comparison to the rest of the tomb. I'm hoping so because I want to really challenge them. But of course, I don't want them all to die either. Uh, and so far, they're still being real careful. Uh, the Magnet Room 8 will be an interesting one to um, uh, to adjudicate when and if and when they go there. Um, so they made it all the way to 17, the area on the upper right, which is open all the way down. And they, I think they teleported over to the other side and there was a treasure chest. And as soon as he examined the treasure chest, it turned into a mimic. So the strong start in this one is um, being eaten by a mimic. Um, uh, I don't know what else, what, what kind of other interesting situation would occur inside of this sort of bottomless, um, this bottomless, it's not bottomless exactly, but it's a long drop down that tunnel. Uh, what would make, you know, could the water all of a sudden start rushing and everyone has to make checks or they start hanging off the side? Uh, like it's been so far not so bad, but maybe like, you know, Withers or somebody else does a big wash and whoosh, and now all the people that are on the southern side of the chamber are getting hit by water while everybody, well, while, you know, our friend is being eaten by a mimic on the, on the northern side. Uh, that could be, uh, the mimic shoves someone off the edge, but the mimic wants to eat them. Let's take a look at mimics and see how mimic is only a CR two. I think we're going to beef that up. 
So I think I think we're gonna give it, you know, I don't know, somehow we'll beef up its hit points a bunch. Uh, 19, 72, 82. 90 so it can have up to 90 hit points um and stay within range we may get tougher but maybe maybe may make this harder maybe it you know multiple pseudopod attacks maybe its reach is longer um give it a big you know a lot more acid damage on its bite uh yeah the mimic latches on and falls off with one of the characters that'd be pretty nasty i don't want to force him over the edge too i want to give him a chance to you know not not fall uh because if they fall away down to 64 that changes everything but it's kind of fun too so the fact that a couple of the characters so, so um i talked about the strong start uh but we should quickly go back and talk about the characters uh so we have smoke uh smoke will not be there today uh gabriel tharmond who is the celestial warlock uh, the interesting bit there is gabriel died and his soul is being trapped by the soulmonger so he's actually seeing other parts um, yeah, Dex to save, Dex save to hold onto the ledge with the mimic attached. Yeah. Um, Gabriel, so Tharmond is the character now, but is in the body of Gabriel and Gabriel's soul is being trapped by the soulmonger and he's having visions of being pulled out. So he, he's, you know, there's some interesting fun dreams that are going there. Uh, Punchy is made of plant stuff. Uh, he is a Kenku samurai who wants to fly and is made of plant stuff. Uh, he was touched by Sararak and you know, mentally touched by Sararak, and he's connected to Zugtamoy and possesses an idol of Zugtamoy. Um, he's really got Zugtamoy all over him. Uh, Warren, gnome druid who wants to be a huge beast. Ogechi, shadow magic warlock tied to the um, uh, tied to the night serpent. Uh, one of, who else wasn't going to be there today? Somebody else said they wouldn't be able to make it. I don't remember... Uh, Huey Zulin was a question mark. And I might have guests. I don't know. I, I emailed. I emailed. So I should check and see if any of my friends would be able to make it. Email a couple of my friends to show up. It's possible I screwed up and I could have seven people today. Uh, or five. Who knows? Uh, nope. Nope. So um, it may just be, I don't know, maybe three, four, five. I'm not sure how many people are going to show up. So one interesting thing is because the tomb is the way the tomb. Oh, uh, who is it? So Punchy uh, is also is also possessed by Obalaka, who like went into his brain and then realized he's connected to Zugdamoy and is now like screaming in, you know, insanity because he realizes that uh, Punchy's brain extends out to all of like the growth in in the whole peninsula. So I'll tell you, Punchy probably has more people in his head than anyone, which is pretty crazy. Um, uh, what else? So that is where the game ended. That is where it will start is the mimic. And I might just make the mimic I might make it like a lot stronger, like an uber mimic. I'm just going to beef it up a bunch. A couple of attacks, plus eight to attack. A lot more damage. Make it really hard. Max its damage out. Let's see. Eight plus 11 bludgeoning damage per hit. couple of hits. Uh, adhesive trait. Mimic adheres to anything and grappled. We'll give it its grapple check. So we'll make it stronger. Maybe give it its strength of 20 instead of 17. That gives it a couple... Couple more to hit, you know. Particularly strong mimic by a strong. Uh, little cheat when you want to work on a monster is just like pick a stat that it's good at, like strength, and just beef it up. So you can just say, okay, strength goes from seventeen to twenty, so now it's plus five, and um, that means that its pseudopad goes up by two, its damage goes up by two, its DC for grappling goes up by two. Uh, you know, you just can kind of increase a lot of its base stats by a couple points. Um, and it's a pretty easy template to kind of apply to a creature, uh, and not have to do a lot of bookkeeping. So, um, uh, so that can, that can work pretty well. I was, you know, talking to my wife today on our walk about 3.5 and how we used to have to, um, 
the DMs had to apply like character templates onto monsters and how much of a horrendous pain in the ass that was. Uh, and now we don't have to do that anymore. We could just say, yeah, we'll just tweak a stat. Flat math makes it easy to sort of tweak a stat and beef up a character. So um, what scenes are going to take place? I, I, I do not think I'm going to fill this out um, because I don't really know. I will say that like f it's probably worth looking at 14 like the, you know looking at the rest of this level is probably handy you can kind of say like okay i know they're going to start in 17 so if i go like one dimension out from 17 where could they go and the answer is they could go to 14 i'm going to open this up in a new win new window um look at that big map i love these maps man so they're in 17 so 17 could go to uh, 64, which we'll read up on. It could go to, uh, they could back, uh, go to 14. Uh, they could go to, um, uh, they could probably, so they could backtrack and go to eight because they know about that secret door. So they, possible they go to eight. Um, they could go down those stairs to level two. Uh, let's do a quick. Da, 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 da. Which would take them to 27. Uh, 14, where else? Eight. Uh, and maybe 15 and 16, right? So let's cover, we'll do these in order, sorry, OCD. Um, so what scenes might take place? Let's take a look quickly at eight. Uh, da, da, stop, how do I close this? Who puts a close button in the bottom left corner? When I played my group, stupidly went down the secret stairs all the way to level five on our second day in the tomb. Not all of us made it back upstairs, yeah. so. That's the trick with this adventure. I've read, and, and probably my number one piece of advice for running this so far is read it because they can't go anywhere. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I just said like, well, what's one dimension out from where they are? And I've got six rooms and that's one dimension out. They'll probably go two, three dimensions out, but that's the whole dungeon. So um, the because it's not a linear dungeon, it's actually a pretty hard work on a DM to have to read it all. And it's huge. So, um, magnetic, magnetic, um, magical attraction. Uh, this is one where everybody starts to lose their stuff. Um, the iron shield and, uh, there's metal magical field. Uh, any magical object comes in direct contact with the shield disintegrates, showering the floor and powder dust. Artifacts are immune. Any metal object not being worn or carried that enters the room is instantly drawn to the shield. If it weighs 150 pounds, not worn or carried, so anything put down. Any creature wearing or carrying metal items in his room must see the DC strength check to resist it. On a failed check, the creature loses funding, flies across the station, slams into the state, taking one bludgeoning damage. If the creature is wearing any metal armor, it's destroyed. Um, this isn't too bad because it's only a DC 10. Uh, smoke is not dead. Uh, the character is, um, the, the player is not going to make it today. Uh, and the character for Wheatsley might not be there either. I'm not sure. Hopefully he's there. Uh, so this isn't so bad. This is one of those where it's like, it's, you know, and I'm, I'm never really a big fan of these because there's no like variance. It's either like, if you make your check, everything's good. If you fail your check, you're totally screwed. Um, and DC 10 check isn't so bad. So most people could probably resist it, but then it's like, well, what do you, how do you deal with it? Um, so they'll have to like, you know, they'll have to figure out how to destroy it or dispel it. I guess that's the main thing is how do you get past it, right? Uh, yeah, so they have to somehow get through the room. And the idea is like, as soon as they enter the room, they have to pull back out of the room as soon as they step in or else they fly and hit it and all their stuff is destroyed. Um, so that's pretty cool. Okay, so that's eight. Uh, let's go down to 14. Uh, I think 14 is, yeah, 14 is Moa's Shrine. I think I'm gonna nerf Moa's ability too. So, um, 
uh, so this is the one with the skull of a child and you have to talk to the skull of the child and if the skull finds out it's a skull, then, um, uh, then uh, it will scream out and becomes a flame skull, which again is not a very powerful monster for this area. So I might, I might beef that up. Could, should be a demi lich, of course. And then also uh, swarms of insects come in, six swarms. So, you know, six plus, you know, two swarms for every character above four. Um, so it's kind of a fun one. And the skull could be interesting. Um, uh, yeah, and they have to talk to it to explore. And then they open it up and they find the um, Jakuli no Moa's animal form and a staff of the python, which is pretty cool. And then they get, um, I'm going to open this in a new tab. So then they get uh, Moa's spirit. And what I don't like about Moa's spirit is that it, um, where is she? She's all the way down here. No, not Moa. Uh, it's the Kubazan? No, where is it? Wongo? Wongo. Oh, that's the enemy. I'm confused. Hang on. Sorry confused moa's spirit so moa okay host can use an action to turn invisible that's a fine one i don't mind that one at all i'm not going to nerf that um it's powerful because it can go invisible all the time i'm thinking of making these you know they're really powerful and the idea that you can turn invisible at will is pretty powerful it's still an action but like why wouldn't you do it all the time and you're probably going to do it all the time so I'm worried about that one. And the idea that you could do it once a, once a, maybe on, maybe it resets on a short rest. I think, I think I'm going to be an ass and, and limit these to short rests for some of them, for that one, um, for the, you know, I don't know you guys. In, am I nerfing these too much? I know that they're supposed to be hard. It just feels like your character completely changes when you, when you do some of these. Uh, I do not plan on continuing the campaign. It's not really the matter of how powerful it is. It's that it kind of changes the character a lot. Like, you know, uh, the invisibility, I mean, if it's if, at will, it lasts as long as they want. Um, in fact, it, what it says is the effect lasts until it, it hosts attacks, casts a spell, forces a saving throw, or deals damage. Um, so it could last a long time. Uh, I don't mind it lasting that long. I don't mind it lasting as long as they want it to last. I just don't think you should be able to immediately cast it the next turn. Um, and the idea of sort of limiting these things to, um, like, these are all just crazy, like DC, you know, deck score to 23. So now some of these is they don't know which one they're going to get. So a lot of time the, a person is going to get an ability score that doesn't benefit them. So I'm not as worried about that. Um, it's very possible they'll get ones that aren't that useful for the character, but I think I might limit some of these to short, to, to, uh, uh take place on a short rest. Uh, spider climb all the time isn't so bad. Attuning the magic item isn't so bad. Can't be surprised. And advantage on wisdom checks isn't so bad. Extra attack isn't so bad. It depends on who gets it. But the sonic assault that you can stun someone, that's really, you know, right. right head, Ranger with a headband of intellect. You know, I mean, they're cool. Like, it's nice to have an ability score that's 23. But it's like, you know, if your fighter gets the strength of 23, holy cow. You know, that's just mean. Um, uh, okay, sorry. So that was 14, is the skull with the girl in it and the um, sarcophagus. Uh, I have to make sure to have a, I, I think I do have a good sarcophagus. I have a bag of, or box of Dwarven Forge that I'm bringing with me. And um, it's nice to build out these rooms. And one of the things I have is this, uh, uh, is the little coffin. So that was 14. Uh, 15 is this hall. Uh, let's take a look at 15. The wind tunnel. Quarters, a single pressure plate, uh, adamantine propeller, thunders into motion when 20 pounds of pressure is placed on the floor to floor, activate, boom, it goes roaring up. Carved birds on the walls. 
Yeah, that looks like fun. When the when the propeller is spinning up or slowing down, a creature can leap through the gap t- uh, between two blades with a DC 20. On a fail check, they take 33 slashing. Full speed, it deals 66 slashing. Uh, vicious. Uh, immovable rod can fix it. Other magic items wedged between and knocked aside. DC 20 check to hold it in place. So that's fun. Big propeller. I'm not sure I'm going to let them switch their gods out because there could be this min-maxing of like, how do we trick the gods into jumping into the wrong people or the right people? And, you know, I don't like the idea that like, oh, well, I, I should get the dex one. So let's figure out how I can dump the dex one and then you can put that one in me. You know, and then every time they find a new temple, like before we touch that, who wants it, right? So I'd rather they have to kind of figure out like, what do we think we will get from the particular God we're looking at? And then that's the one. Uh, And they might be wrong than the alternative. Um, So we'll see. Also, some of the players are know that I'm going to be nerfing the, 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 the trickster God things because they're like, they'll, they're playing in other games. Uh, This is not a direct kill. It doesn't look like um, some of the other traps in this uh, immediately kill whoever is uh, dropped to zero by it. There's a lot of those like, and you'd think this would be one uh, that like if they fell into the propeller, they would be chopped into tiny, tiny pieces, but it doesn't say anything about that. So that's a propeller. What else we got? Uh, 16. Wongo. Uh, Starling monkey like creature carved black onyx, black chest made of rusty iron. Three sarcophagi, each chest or three treasure chests. Uh, three inch long gold key. Uh, the clicks, got, cl- clicks within the lid is the clamps down and key release. Climbs inside the chest and closes the lid, can turn the golden key with ease. If the chest key is turned while well, the chest is shut, the chest locks and clamps shut once more. Any character inside the chest of this happens is trapped. Button magically cheers in the lid. Uh, whenever, one of the th- whenever one of the three chests is locked, a carved button magically appears in the lid. The material in each button matches the corresponding chest. Uh, onyx, rusty iron, or silver. Pressing the button simultaneously lo- unlocks the associated chest and triggers a trap within it. Onyx button. Holy cow, this is pretty lethal. Ah, and a Sioux monster mummy. That's cool. Uncanny Adventure says, that room is scary. Uh, did you say someone used a teleport spell in the tomb? No one used a teleport spell in the tomb. Uh, they used a Misty Step. Misty Step is not on the alternative spell list. And they Misty stepped across the thing. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Misty Step is allowed. It's like you can see exactly where it's going. Uh, Mummy attacks with the Mace of Terror. So that's cool. So that is 16. Uh, 27. Forge of the Tomb Dwarves is room 27. How do they get to 27? Uh, is that through the secret? That must be going down the stairwell. Because that's a secret stairwell. Um, so that's this is your hack the temple. Like you figured out a secret way. Uh, so this one you see... Uh, where they are crafting tomb guardians. Ooh. And there's a lantern. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this could be a cool one where they're building Tomb Guardians. So we'll get into Tomb Guardians now. Um, and Tomb Guardians, uh, so this is going to be a fun secret, right? Um, these are Dwarven, what are they called? The, uh, the Tomb Dwarves. So Tomb Guardians, let me show you guys something cool. Tomb Guardians can get boring um, if you, uh, uh, Tomb Guardians can get a little boring because they're all the same. So I've been working on, and will probably release as an article, a Tomb Guardian generator where you can feed five variables into your Tomb Guardians and uh, come up with stuff like this. What is the source? What, what, what was the original Tomb Guardian body before? Uh, what is it armed with on its left and right hand, and what spell infuses it. So you could have a Dark Elf Tomb Guardian with a forceful flare, flail and a poisonous dagger infused with the improved invisibility spell. How badass is that? Dark Elven, you know, Dark Elven. So let's, let's some monsters here. We will pick a few of these. Uh, Um, human tomb guardian with necrotic flail and psychic morning star. Yeah. Where's that one? Uh, Step Back History really likes that storm-themed guardian in the first one, so we will do that one. We might, uh, Cloud Coat could be a storm cloud, right? So there's four. Uh, oh, somebody likes the gorilla. Where's the gorilla? <laughs> the sleeping gorilla, yeah. So he like beats the crap out of him and then he breathes out and they fall asleep. Sleep. So uh, I think this is really cool. This gets into my whole adding some randomness into our D&D games. And I think that you can really do some interesting stories with stuff like this. Uh, NPCs, Withers, uh, and the Three Sisters. I love these hags. Uh, 
Those are really the, uh, uh, what is a cockerel? I don't even know what that is. Oh, like a chicken? Got it. All right. So those are the three NPCs. So I got my monsters, I got my NPCs, magic items. I uh, don't really need to do anything, but I'll just put a little note. Um, um, hey, for you guys that played through this on Candy Adventures, it looks like you played through this. For the people that got the abilities from the uh, trickster gods, did you find that the, the ones that they could trigger, like the invisibility and the extra attack and the stun, that they were too powerful to be able to do every round? Uh, is it better to do those as a, um, um, on a short rest or am I, is that too heavy a nerf? Uh, Kenny Avenger says, I didn't find him too powerful. The tomb gets pretty crazy deeper in, and even those abilities weren't always a protection. Uh, the combat can get pretty intense. All right. Yeah, maybe I'll leave him as is. It's it's one of those questions where, like, I can't nerf it after the fact, so I want to be careful. But if you guys say that it's not a big deal, then... Um, and my, my group's really not a super min-maxi group, so I don't know that... Uh, I don't know that it'll be a problem. I just don't want him to have, and I guess this isn't a problem. I really don't want him to have an easy time with the tomb. But it wasn't as bad as everybody said. So if you guys are confident that that's not the case. They're level nine, by the way. They'll probably get to level 10 before the end. Uh, they'll get to level 10 about halfway through, maybe when they get the third skull. What else do they need to know? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They need two more secrets. Uh, we have one character that might uh, have it get out of jail, but they'll have to use it knowing they're probably leaving the rest of the party to get seriously hurt or killed. That's a good point. Um, yeah, Tilted to Wilda has a good idea. Maybe I'll nerf it in the beginning, and then I can always release the nerf if I if I don't feel like it'd be a problem. I don't know. That's tough. I, I tend not to give away crazy power. My, my The group, they're not a bunch of power gamers, but they're, they're real smart. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, what other interesting bits of the tomb? What what should characters? What do, what do the players need to know about the tomb? Um, it is a good idea, uh, Tilda. Um, the only trick is I don't know it's too powerful until I give it to them. So. You know, it's one of those where, like, the difference between casting invisibility at will and casting it once an hour is a big difference. Um, and and I won't know if it's too powerful until they actually have it. So, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I think I might just stick to the hour. We'll see. Uh, I need one more secret. What's one more thing they have to learn? I don't know. Let me Let me look down at Area 64, it's kind of the last thing we'll look at. Base of the waterfall, anything that falls from the 17 ends up here. Let's take a look at the map. 
Aha. Oh, this is the gears. Oh, my God. I hear all kinds of nightmares about the gear room. Yeah. So, well, we're just going to jump right in. See how it goes. If they get to the gear room, there's not really much they can do in the gear. Can they even get through these areas or these bridges? Let me read 65. Uh... 30 foot deep characters allow themselves 35 underground lake. Dark lake, festoon of chains and gears, some which appear to have two dwarves dangling from them. A giant mon motionless stone cog rises in the water, and two matching cogs connected to it. Man, this place is awesome. Oh, the Aboleth is here. Ooh. Um. <laughs> the gears are where our squishy party went on this session, too. The gears are up above the lake. If the party ends up in the lake, they'd have to figure out a way to get up on into the gears. Right, but can they get through them? So where's the map of the gears? Uh... So these walkways, for example, can they get underneath the walkway to swim over to 66, for example? I would assume so, right? I would assume they just can't get into the gear room. Um, who is feeding all these dungeon monsters? A Sararak is. A lot of them don't have to eat. The control room that spins the gears in. Yes, you can swim under the walkways. Okay, so they can get, they can get around, but they have to get to the control room. Right, and there's no great, there's no great way to get to the control room if you haven't actually turned a gear. So they can see it all, and they can get to 26, and that can get them out, and then they could get to the gear room. What door? Somebody said, "Beware the door." Where, which door should they beware of? And do I need to beware of it, or is that mostly the characters need to be aware of it? <laughs> Sarek, you can have an abolith, but only if you walk it every day. At the dock, okay, cool, 66, let's read that. So I mean, it's complicated. I read all this stuff, but you know, I read it linearly and killer doors. Uh, work stone column, stretches in the bottom of the, uh, on the side of the column, the of the stone steps, climb to the stone dock, to the landing with stone door, shadows, uh, no handles or hinges, ropes, lash a pair of rowboats to the post. Stone door separating the mooring radiates abjuration, conjuration, and illusion easily from the west side simply by pulling on the brass knob. The door is much harder from the east side. Hungry door. I'm so hungry I could eat you alive, but I'll settle for something else, something living, something light. Uh, any character. The mouth is similar to that created by a magic mouth. Uh, isn't programmed to say anything else, it's, but it wants to eat a crab, it looks like. I'm trying to... And the crab shells. Uh, clue. Once the method has been fed, it disappears. If the character tosses anything in the method that isn't phosphorescent, it spits it out. If the character is within 10 feet of the door, when it happens, the door wraps its tongue around the character and swallows the character whole. And then they are teleported to Area 57, which I believe is where the Atiog and stuff is, right? Uh... Yeah, no attack roll, no saving throw, but you're not exactly killed. You're just sent to Area 57, which isn't so bad. It's just a room with an Atiug by yourself and a green devil face. <laughs> this is some craziness. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I don't have a 10th. Uh, I should have it. I need a 10th. What's a 10th? I need a 10th secret. I got two minutes. I got two minutes for a 10th secret. Oh, what can they learn about the tomb? What do they know about it? Uh, uh, a Sarak isn't really paying the tomb.
There, I thought of a secret step back history. Ah, 10, 10, 10th secret. So there we go. Some good thoughts. Um, you know, I feel good about it. I'm happy with what I've got here. Uh, could always drop an hint Easter egg in the next campaign. I think my next campaign is gonna be a nice, relaxing time in Waterdeep, looking for gold. Um, that's what the Sunday group is going to do. My Wednesday group, I, I think I'm going to try to convince them to play Shadow of the Demon Lord. I really want to play Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, so we'll see if I can, if I can do that. Uh, let's mail myself. So anybody have any questions, any thoughts about Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, about the steps, what doesn't work, uh, what falls apart? Um, I'm still waiting for my, this totally doesn't work. You made all this crap up review, but so far nobody's posted that. Not that you have to, by the way, if you happen to like Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, uh, you would be awesome if you left a review on RPG Now or Amazon. Uh, that would help me a lot. Uh, probably if you're not my mom. If you're my mom, it would probably best not to leave a review. That gets around. Uh... Uh, my game prep notes are sent to myself. Very good. My friends, it has been an hour. Uh, I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank you all for, uh, for those of you in Twitch. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's always a great pleasure to talk to all of you. Uh, well, it is all sort of made up inspiration from the actual adventure. That's the point of making stuff up is to be easier than written, right? Make, make stuff up to make it easier than written, right? I think so. Yes. I think I, uh, anyway, everybody have a wonderful day. Uh, I hope you get some gaming in. If you don't get a chance to play a game, maybe go watch a game. There's a lot of cool games out there. Uh, there's the C team, there's, um, dice camera action. There's of course, critical role, lots of ways to watch some D and D. So, um, go get your D and D on and, uh, roll some dice. Have a great day.